الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه كما يحب ربنا ويرضى أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله الناصح الأمين اللهم صل على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تمسك بسنته إلى يوم الدين ثم أما بعد حدثني جماعة من الشيوخ بإسناد كل إلى سفيان بن عيينة عن عمرو بن دينار عن أبي قابوس مولى عبد الله بن عمر عن عبد الله بن عمرو بن عاص رضي الله تعالى عنهما أنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الراحمون يرحمهم الرحمن ارحموا من في الأرض يرحمكم من في السماء The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said in a tremendous hadith that those who show mercy those who are merciful they will be shown mercy by the most merciful show mercy to those who are in the earth and the one who is above the heavens he will show you mercy قال العلماء ذلك بأن العلم رحمة نتيجته رحمة في الدنيا وغايته رحمة في الآخرة The ulama, they say this is because knowledge is mercy. The result of knowledge is mercy in this world. And the ultimate goal of knowledge is mercy in the hereafter. We continue going over the tremendous work by the great Imam, Imam al Nawawi, his 40 hadith. We are still on the hadith, Ya Ibadi, and we have reached the final sentence of this hadith. We're on the authority of the Prophet وسلم, who narrates upon his Lord that he, Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, that Allah Ta'ala, he said, Ya Ibadi, innama hiya a'malukum, uhsiha lakum. ثم أوفيكم إياها الله تعالى he says what means O oh my slaves verily it is only your actions it is none but your actions on which I will preserve them for you uh, on which I will preserve them for you and then I will pay you in full as relates to them فَمَنْ وَجَدَ خَيْرًا فَلْيَحْمِدِ اللَّهِ Whoever finds good, then let him thank Allah. وَمَنْ وَجَدَ غَيْرَ ذَلِكَ فَلَا يَلُومَنَّ إِلَّا نَفْسَهِ And whoever finds other than that, then let him blame no one save himself. Or let her blame no one save herself. العلامة الشيخ عبد المحسن العباد البدر حفظه الله تعالى he mentions he says الناس في هذه الحياة that the human beings in this life the human beings in this life مكلفون they are held responsible they are responsible Naam. And they meaning they're going to be questioned. They're going to be questioned about what they had done. They are held responsible and they will be held to account. They are held responsible and they will be held to account. Naam. Bim Tithal Al Awamir. They are held responsible and they will be held to account as relates to the implementation of the commands. 
that they are responsible and it is upon them to implement that in which they have been commanded to do. Wajtinab and Nawahi and to stay away from the prohibitions. To stay away from the prohibitions. If we know that there are certain things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he has commanded us to do that there are commands and if we know that there are certain things in which we are prohibited from doing then it behooves us to find out what are the commands of Allah and how are we instructed to carry out those commands what are the prohibitions in which we must stay away from we have to learn them so that we can stay away from them when we look at it from this angle perhaps we will understand a little better and see the relevance of, of, of the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in our lives that seeking knowledge is obligatory upon every Muslim because if we don't seek knowledge how can we implement the commands because without seeking knowledge without studying we won't even know what the commands are so it is incumbent upon us that we learn what are the commands so we may implement them what are the commands and how have we been instructed to carry out those commands ma'am so that what so we may implement them if we don't seek knowledge how will we be able to discover what are the prohibitions and how do we stay away from the prohibitions without seeking knowledge how can we avoid the haram if we don't know what the haram is now this concept seems to be simple but unfortunately many of the Muslims act as if they are free from needing to seek knowledge and this could be illustrated in the sense or this could be illustrated by the fact that many of the Muslims they are concerned for their children to, to come to the masjid to learn the Quran. So they bring their children to the masjid and drop them off so that they may memorize the Quran. They may learn the Quran, learn how to read. They drop them off and they leave. So what could one understand from this picture? Is that what? Is that these parents, they are in no need of these type of classes because they are all Hufad al Quran and they know how to read the Quran. They know the Tajweed of the Quran. They are fluent in the Lugha of the Quran, of the language of the Quran, so on and so forth. They drop their kids off and they leave. But as most instructors know, you will reach a point and unfortunately, sometimes, often is the case, it doesn't take a long time, that you will reach a point where the parents cannot even help the children with their homework. They can't even help the children with their assignments. So how come these parents don't understand and reflect upon this and realize I need classes myself. I need to be there myself. I need to learn myself. But they act as if, no, I don't need to learn. I'm okay. I'm good. One of the main, if not the main, problem that grips the ummah is a gross level of ignorance a gross level of ignorance the muslims many cases often they don't know what to do nor how to do it they don't know what to stay away from nor how to stay away from it they don't know they do things that are haram, and when it's brought to their attention, oh, I didn't know. We have to learn. There is nothing that we should be doing without a text. Some of the 
the imams of the past, they used to say, don't even scratch your head without a narration if you don't have to. Naam. Speaking of which, which shows the gross level of ignorance and the gross level of neglect speaking about the head of the men. How many men go to the barber shop and they don't even know what kind of haircut to get. They don't even know what kind of haircut to stay away from. And all one has to do is come to any given masjid on Jumu'ah, come to any given musalla on the Eid, and you'll see all types of mohawks and fades and to the end of it. But this type of haircut is what? Is haram. Either you cut it all, one level, or you leave it. You don't cut some, leave some. Some people have a, 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 a tail in the back and so on and so forth. Ya yeah, subhanallah. The Prophet Sallallahu he prohibited this kind of haircut, but they don't even know how they're they supposed to cut their hair. Why? Because they never take the time to learn. And when you bring it to their attention, it's amazing to them. What? Really? Well, I didn't know. As Muslims, what is our what is our call? Samirna wa ta'na. We hear, we obey. Okay. How can you implement that characteristic? How can you adorn yourself with that characteristic? I hear, I obey. Without what? First, learning what is the command. Before you make a move, you got to know what's the command, what's the order. Samirna. We heard it. Ail. Got to have the knowledge. Then after that, what? Atharna. We obey. If you don't know what the command is, how, how are you going to obey it? If you don't have your marching orders, for lack of a better term, how are you going to go out and proceed? How? It seems simple. But as Muslims, we don't live our lives like that. We forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed the Quran. Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent the Prophet sallam, and has revealed to the Prophet sallam, what? The sunnah. Naam. As a manual for our life. This is how we live our life. Okay, so as a Muslim, how are you out there living your life? And you don't have knowledge about the Quran and the Sunnah. How are you going to live your best life? And you don't have knowledge about the Quran and the Sunnah. But yet you have people all the time online, I'm living my best life. Cave, how? How are you living your best life? You know, and you're ignorant about the Kitab and the Sunnah. How are you living your best life? And you don't know, Yani, what 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 are the commands on how you're supposed to live your life? Everything from the way you dress and subhanAllah. You know, people pick on the women. Sister, you should be covered. How many women go outside and they're not properly covered? Their hair is out, they're wearing tight clothes, so on and so forth. Sister, you're wrong. Yeah, you're wrong, sister. If you're coming outside like that, fear Allah. But at the same time, that man that's standing next to you in the gym suit that is thin, doesn't hide anything, that's haram too. You want to blame her and you coming outside looking like this? You want to blame her and then you have men walking around with, 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 with NBA basketball looking shorts on from the 80s like them? And that, that's, that's halal? You think that's halal? Her hair is showing. Yeah, she's wrong. But you think you okay? Your thigh is showing. You think that's okay? Yeah, subhanAllah. It is incumbent that we learn so that we may implement. We learn so that we may act upon. We learn so that we may believe correctly. Because if not, then, then what's the point? Why, how are you going to live your best life? Okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us in his hadith, his hadith al-Qudsi, إِنَّمَا هِيَ أَعْمَالُكُمْ That verily is, is, is nothing but your actions. It, it's just, it's all about your actions. That's what it's about. At the end of it, you come yawm al-qiyamah, it's about your actions. Naam. And they will be saved. They're not going to be forgotten. No, they're going to be saved. They're recorded. This what you did is recorded.
This is just some examples, right? Because you see, we want to listen to the likes of these ahadith, hear the likes of these ahadith, and then look and see how they apply to our day-to-day -day life. Because what, as Muslims, yeah, we all want to live our best life. All of us, right? And that is going to be upon what? Upon the Quran, upon the Sunnah, the Quran and the Sunnah upon the understanding of the self of this of this Ummah. That's how you live your best life. That you believe, like the Prophet and the Sahaba believe, that's how you live your best life. That you worship like the Prophet and the Sahaba used to worship. That's how you live your best life. That your adab, your akhlaq is like that of the Prophet and the companions. That's how you live your best life. Your methodology, your minhaj is, is like that of the Prophet Sallallahu and the companions. That's how you live your best life. Naam. And that has nothing to do with money. That has nothing to do with what you possess. It has nothing to do with anything yani, linked with the worldly uh, uh, yani, uh, uh, possessions, so on and so forth. No, you can be dead poor and live your best life. You could be a billionaire and live your best life. And at the same time, you can be a billionaire and live wretched, lower than an animal. And you can be dead poor and live wretched, lower than an animal. If you're not applying the guidance of the Quran and the Sunnah upon the understanding of the self of this Ummah, you could be a billionaire and you're lower than an animal. You're worse than a dog. You're worse than a snake. You're worse than a pig. This is the reality. So this is what I want us to take away from this. We hear the likes of these ahadith. Okay, how does this apply to me and my life? What do I have? What do I have to do? So, yeah, I, need, yeah, I can benefit from what I heard. Because if not, then what's, what's the point? What's the point? What's the point of tuning in? What's the point of coming and listening? For what? What's the point of taking notes? For what? Right? For what? I mean, unless you're just trying to make it a hujjah against you. I mean, I mean, you know, choice is yours. <clears throat> the Sheikh goes on, he says, Whatever that they do from actions, whether it is good or whether it is evil, is saved, is recorded, is recorded, is saved. And everybody will find in front of him on the day of judgment what he did. Whatever he did, you're going to find it. It'll be there. It'll be there. And khayran, for khayran, if it's good, then it's good. Alhamdulillah, it's good. Ma'am. Wa in sharran, for sharran. But if it's evil, it's bad. That's bad. That's bad. قال الله تعالى الله تعالى he says فمن يعمل مثقال ذرة خير يرى whoever does the smallest good will see it ومن يعمل مثقال ذرة شر يرى and whoever does the smallest evil you're gonna see it نعم whoever does the smallest good you'll see it the smallest evil you'll see it and this is in سورة what Right? This is this is in one of those chapters that the children when they come to the Quran program, they all learn. Yeah, maybe some of the parents know it well. Most of them should know it well. Unfortunately, some might have learned it and forgot it from when they was little. They're more happy the fact that they're a doctor, that they're an engineer, they're a lawyer, they're a computer programmer. Right? They're more happy with the, the, these these accomplishments. All of these accomplishments that end that retirement or the grave, whichever one comes first. But it doesn't really, you know, you know, really, right? But this is there. So this is important. This is a, a, an advice to the instructors that as you are going over the Quran with the children, that you teach them the meanings. You teach them the meanings of it so that they understand, right? And if that is just by reading the translation so that they can understand, then read the translation from. Uh, the noble quran inshallah ta'ala read it to them right and make sure they understand it make sure they understand it and encourage them to to learn 
And I don't want anyone to go beyond their ability. Because some instructors, they have just memorized the Quran. That's it. They themselves may not understand fully what is there. Okay? So I don't want anyone to go beyond their ability, but read the translation to them so that they understand. Read the translation to them so that they understand and so that the instructor will benefit themselves, inshallah ta'ala. It's very important. It's very important. The Shaykh he says, فَمَنْ قَدَّمَ خَيْرًا وَجَدَ ثَوَابَهُ أَمَامَهُ Whoever does good, then he will find his reward in front of him. Now I want you to check this out. Whoever does good, he will find good, he will, he will be rewarded for that. Now listen. وَالثَّوَابْ مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْعَمْدِ The reward is from the Allah's bounty upon the slaves. I want you to write this down. One, the reward is Allah's bounty upon the slave. Right? That's a bounty. The reward is Allah's bounty upon the slave. The slave does good, he'll be rewarded. That's from Allah's bounty upon the slave. Now, and I want you to write next to that one, number one. Okay? وَفِعْلِ الْخَيْرِ فِي الدُّنْيَا هُوَ مِنْ تَوْفِيقِ اللَّهِ لِلْعَبْدِ And doing good in this world, this is from the success that Allah has granted the slave. This is from the success that Allah has granted to the slave. Right? Yeah, got that, that got that second part, the second um sentence, or the second part of that sentence. It is and doing good, performing good in this world. This is from the the success that Allah has given to the slave. This is from the success that Allah has given to the slave. So then the Shaykh he follows up and he says, Falahu Al Fadlul Awal Awalan wa akhiran. Naam. So for him is the bounty in the first and in the end. In the first and in the end. Okay? Alright. What are these? Two bounties. What are the two bounties and which one comes first? The reward and the success. That's what? Those are the two bounties, right? Okay. So the reward is one bounty and the success to do the good is a bounty, right? All right, which one comes first? Success. The, the doing of the? Of the good. Of the good. Which one comes second? Getting the reward. Getting the reward. Uh, right, because you do the good where? Before. Uh, in, this, in this world. In this world. And when, when do you get paid? In the next world. The next world, right? Exactly. Day of judgment, okay. These are two bounties, right? And both of these bounties are from who? Allah. From Allah. So with that being the case, nobody should ever get a big head. Nobody should ever get a big head. Because what? It's from Allah. Allah showed you what was good by revealing his book, by sending his messenger to you. By sending to you, yani, uh, sending his messenger to you, by yani, the ulama teaching and spreading the good, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed that what it'll reach you. Allah ta'ala decreed that you will be given success to implement it. And then Allah ta'ala gave you the success what, in doing it. And now you come on a day of judgment, Allah ta'ala rewards you for it. So now what part of that was all about you? 
What part of that is just from you? Nothing. It's all about the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So none of us should become big-headed about nothing. The more righteous you become, the more you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu he used to pray at night time until his feet. What happened to his feet? They will swell up and blister. Why? Because he stood for so long. And when he was asked about it, what did he say? Should I not? Should I not be thankful? Should I not be show gratitude? Where's our gratitude? This I'm, I'm saying is I want us all to to understand this and and, and 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 really, I want us to, I want us to really feel indebted unto Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala because we are and we can never pay Allah for all the bounties He has given us, never. We we, we don't even know all the bounties Allah Taala has given to us. We don't even know all of them. We've taken, yeah, we, we, we recognize some of them, right? But we don't even know all of them. We don't know. And, and if we had the biggest calculator in the world, it don't go that high. We will never be able to enumerate all of the bounties in which Allah Ta'ala has bestowed upon us. So, 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 so the believer, the one who he yeah, has in and I say he's an alim. No, no, I say he's an alim. But one who has some knowledge, some beneficial knowledge, what does it do? It humbles them. It humbles them. It makes them what? More appreciative. It makes them worship Allah Ta'ala more. It makes them strive harder to be obedient unto Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala because they recognize all of the good Allah Ta'ala has given to them. And they realize that they themselves are impoverished. They can't do anything. They're weak. They can't do nothing. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. All of it is by what is from the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah ta'ala's bounty upon them. So this should encourage them, what? To, to, to be humble servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it will make them never look down on people. Who Looking down on someone for what? You poor. You ain't got nothing. You impoverished. How are you looking down on someone? How are you arrogant? You have nothing. You own nothing. Everything belongs unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how are you arrogant? How are you looking down on someone? Because they don't know something that you know today? Well, you know what? There was a day from the days when you ain't know it either. So now what? You don't know how it's going to end. They may end better than you. So now what? How are you ever going to look down on someone? You don't know their secrets. And they don't know your secrets. What about that? Right? You don't know their secrets. And they don't know your secrets. Everyone knows how evil they could be. And the filth that they do. That's hidden. That they will rather die than the people know about it. So how, so how are we ever going to look down on somebody? How? Really? This is why it is important that we understand the likes of this and we keep and we remain humble. Abu Bakr as Siddiq, the one who the Prophet said that if the, yani, the Iman of Abu Bakr was placed in a scale and everybody else's Iman, who will win? Abu Bakr. Right? Abu Bakr as Siddiq, he said what? He said, Never did I hear a verse about. Yeah, Allah's punishment, except I thought it was talking about me. Never did I hear a verse about the reward and the good people, except that I, was talk I thought it was talking about somebody else. That's how Abu Bakr was. Umar, he used to go to Hudayfa and say, did the Prophet mention me? The Prophet gave you the names of the hypocrites. Did he mention me? He was scared. This is Umar. The one who the Prophet Sallallahu said, when he came down the street, Shaitan crossed the street. Shaitan didn't want to be on the same side of the street, the same side of the road as him. And he was scared. So now, come on. How, how are we going to be? You know what I mean? How, how are we going to be arrogant and feel, you know, that we have arrived? And you had those who are better than us. We can never even match them, let alone... Beat them. Like, if you can't catch me, you can't beat me, 
right? We, if we racing, we racing, we running, right? If you can't catch me, then you can't beat me. You can't win. Okay, so how about, we ain't catching them. We're not going to catch them, period. So just put that out your mind. We're not catching them. We'll never be better than them, ever. They, they were built different, as they say, right? We'll never be as good as them. We just got to try. But if this is how they were, how are we arrogant? And this is from the reason that they're better than us. Because they knew. They were humble. They put everything in the right place. Remember we talked about Vol? Yeah, you understand? So, this is just something to think about. Something to reflect on. This is good medicine for us. So that we stay in our lane. Our heads don't get big. We understand that Allah Ta'ala is the one who has given it to us. And if we act up, Allah Ta'ala will take it from us. So the Shaykh, he says, whoever does good, he'll see it in front of him. Naam. Whoever does good, he'll see it in front of him. The two bounties Allah Ta'ala has given us. That he, that we did the good and that he rewards us for the good. The Shaykh, he says, Ah, and that verily it only comes from themselves whatever evil they do whatever evil we do that's from us we did that right whatever evil we do that's from us we did that right if a person commits an evil he commits a sin can't say well somebody forced me to do it I mean a sin that's written against you a sin that's written against you because if bona fide somebody put a gun to your head and said, drink this beer, I'm going to blow your brains out, and you drink the beer, is that a sin on you? No, it's not a sin on you because you were forced. You didn't want to do it. You was forced to do it. So I'm talking about what's written against you. What's written against you is because you, you did it. That was your, That's yours. You have to own that. Right? So if any sin comes, that's from us. We did that. Now, wa jinayatihi ala nafsi. And that's from the evil that we did ourselves. Ma'am. So the Shaykh, he says, يعني, الخير, Whoever has sees in front of him other than good, then this, has, this is from the slave, it came from himself. And his, يعني, uh, his sin, يعني, uh, his disobedience to his Lord, his disobedience and his sin to his Lord and to يعني, the crime that he has committed. Alamen, ala nafsi. It's a crime he committed against himself. Naam. فَإِذَا وَجَدَ أَمَامَهُ الْعَذَابِ So thus, if he sees in front of him punishment, he comes down in, in the day of judgment, and he sees that is what was waiting for him is what is punishment. فَلَا يَلُمَنَّ إِلَّا نَفْسَهُ That he cannot blame anyone except himself. It's your fault. If you got to go to hell, it's your fault. Right, and 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 I want us to and I want us to understand that, and I want us to really try to wash our wash ourselves. You know, they say you know uh, 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 clean your laundry, you know, wash your laundry, right? I want us to really think about that as far as meaning our, our our sins. Wash wash your heart, wash your heart, uh, clean your record, clean your record from the sins that you got. How you do that by making toba? How you clean your record? How you wash your heart by being obedient unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, making dhikr, reading the Quran, doing what you're supposed to be doing. That's how you clean your heart. Naam. That's how you clean your heart. Making repentance is how you clean your heart. Clean your heart. Clean your register. Clean your register. So that you don't come your muqiyam and, and, and you jammed up. Why am I saying all this? It's because, listen, if a believer does a good deed, how much is that worth? One good deed is, is worth how much? Ten. Ten what? At least. That's, that's, the, that's the bare minimum. You do a good deed is equal to what? How many? Ten. That's the given for the believer. You with me? All the way up to what? Seven hundred times. For what? For one good deed. One good deed, seven hundred something credits. 
right? 700 something rewards. You with me? 10 to 700 to even more than that. Allah Ta'ala, he rewards whom he pleases. I want you to reflect on this. Okay? If you do an evil deed, how much is that against you? One. One evil deed equals what? One mark against you. One evil deed, one mark against you. Everybody's with me? Now, if we come on the day of judgment and our bad deeds outweigh our good deeds, that for every bad deed, we only got one. For every good deed, we got at least 10 all the way up to 700 or more. So if your bad deeds outweigh your good deeds, that's your fault. You know how much evil you got to do? You got to do 10 sins to match one good deed that you got the minimum reward for. Do you understand that? You have to do 10 sins to match one good deed that you got the minimum, minimum reward for. So you know how much evil we got to commit to have more evil deeds than good deeds? Not to mention Toba erases the evil deed. Not to mention that righteous good deeds erase the minor evil deeds. So if you come, if we come and we have more evil deeds, then we were evil individuals. So if you see that hell in front of you on the day of judgment, you deserve that. That's what you get. Don't blame no one but yourself. I just want you to reflect on that as we move through this dunya, right? Because this, these type of things, they're not just relevant when we come to the masjid. It's not just relevant in auspicious occasions. This is life, man. This is relevant in our life. As long as you breathe in, as long as your heart is beating, this is relevant in your life. And this is how you have to apply it. This is, these are life lessons. This is how we walk through life. When I'm at work, this is, this is relevant. When I'm at home, this is relevant. When I'm in a masjid, this is relevant. If I'm in Minnesota, this is relevant. If I'm in Mecca, this is relevant. Look, man, if I'm on Jupiter, this is relevant. Period. This is how we got this. This this is how the mindset that we gotta have and live when 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 we live our lives with Allah Taala. If we truly want to benefit, so the sheikh is sheikh. He says if he find other than that, he find in front of him that blame nobody but yourself. You put yourself in that situation. The things that we benefit from this hadith and the sheikh he mentions uh, quite a few thirteen benefits that we get from this hadith. The first of them he said is that this hadith. Then this is from the hadith in which the Prophet Sallallahu he narrated upon his Lord. And this hadith, it contains therein uh, first person pronouns that refer back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah ta'ala says, Ya ibadi, O my slaves, huh? Allah's slaves. Now, because these, this, this is Allah speaking. The Prophet Sallallahu he is informing us of what Allah said. Now, and this type of hadith is called what? Qudsi. Qudsi. So that's the first thing we want to take away from this hadith. That this hadith is from the hadith of Qudsi. But, the second thing is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has prohibited oppression, vul, upon his self. And what's, what's, what's vul as a review is what? Uh, putting, things in the wrong place. putting things in the wrong place. That's, 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 that's vul. Allah ta'ala, he has prohibited vul upon his self. Naam. And he has freed himself from vul. Naam. So vul is to be disassociated from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no oppression. So this is, and, and, and I want you to reflect upon this. I want you to remember this as well. This is a clear evidence because this is, this is, this is something that universally people acknowledge. Their fitrah acknowledges this. And this is one of the greatest proofs and evidences against the Christians. Right? It's one of the, this one of the biggest proofs and evidences against the Christians to make them think and to show them how their concept in the original sin and uh, Isa, quote unquote, dying for their sin doesn't add up. 
doesn't add up. Because what, what sin did Isa do? Okay, how he dying for everybody else's sin? We sin, he get killed? That sound right? No way. Right? If a person murders somebody, and we say, you murder somebody, we know you murder somebody, so we're going to go kill him. You're going to say, oh, that's wrong. How you going to kill him? He didn't do nothing. What, what are you punish him for? Right? You're going to say that's wrong. That's crazy. What kind of justice system is this? The killer get caught, and then you go kill somebody else? Nah, somebody got to die, so all right, we're going to let you slide. We're going to kill him. It's even now, right? No, that's one. Somebody steal, you get arrested? How? I didn't, I wasn't the cat burglar. It was this dude. He the one that just scaled the, down the tree and whatever and stole everything. He came in the window and stole it. How you, how you going to... I don't even live on that side of town. How you arresting me? I didn't do it. Right? No, I mean, yeah, I might. They say you fit the description. But this case, you don't even fit the description. Now, nah, we know it's not you. But hey, somebody got paid, man. So look, we seen you first. We said that's one. Okay, the Christians base their whole religion on this. How you base your religion upon this oppression and then you yani, attribute it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah ta'ala is free from this. And this is what you have to remind them. Do you believe that Allah is just? Do you believe that the creator is just? They're going to say yes. That's the fitrah. The fitrah feel funny saying no. You're going to say yeah. The most just? Yes. His justice is perfect. Yes. So how do you explain this? You see, then they, they, yo, no, then they start shucking and jiving. But the one who's sincere, it'll make him think. Ah, you might, you might got a point there. It might open him up. But this is how these are some approaches you want to bring to them to show them that this concept is rejected. Is this concept is rejected, right? And the other things that are linked to that, that of course is rejected as well. Because if the theory goes, okay, if, if my sin has already been paid for, then what's the point? I can do whatever I want to. They already died for it. Like, go in front of the judge and say that. America is based upon Christianity, right? Judge, okay, yeah. Yeah, I did it. But I'm good, though. Jesus got me, right? Judge going to say, man, no. Ain't nobody going to accept that. That's your line of defense. Because it don't make sense. You understand? So this concept... This is a universal truth that people understand. That Allah Ta'ala is the most just. Allah Ta'ala is the most just. There is no oppression that comes from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala any which way, shape, and form. So we use that as a proof of evidence what, against the kuffar who try to tell us these things that are not that 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 that, that, that are wrong and lies upon Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Allah Ta'ala, he negates injustice from himself while affirming the perfection of his justice, that he is the most just and no one justice is like Allah's justice. Allah is perfect in justice. Now, put everything in his right place. So those who have to go to hell, it's because what? They deserve it. They're right where they belong. And we ask Allah Ta'ala to make us never of those ones. I mean, the third point of benefit, <clears throat> the Shaykh he mentions, he says is, um, that Allah Ta'ala, he has made injustice bull prohibited amongst his slaves. He has made it prohibited that we are not allowed to oppress one another. We are not allowed to commit acts of injustice to one another. We're not allowed to do that. It's haram. No? Prohibited. The fourth point of benefit is the extreme and vital and critical need of the slaves to ask their Lord for guidance, for food, and for clothes. And other than that, from the, from the affairs of their deen, of their religion, and from the affairs of their worldly life. So whatever you got going on in your life, ask Allah. Nah, you need you need some you need some shoes, you need some uh, some pants, you need some socks. Ask Allah. Ask Allah. Make dua to Allah subhanahu wa taala, and then take the the asbab and take the the causes. Nah. 
Ask Allah to guide you. Ask Allah to feed you. Ask Allah for everything. Ask Allah. The fifth point of benefit is that Allah loves for his slaves to ask them about everything that they need, whether it be from the affairs of their religion or from the affairs of their worldly life. Allah loves that his slaves ask him for anything and everything that they need. Because what? Whatever Allah wills is, whatever he does not will, it is not. So you ain't going to get nothing except by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't feel good? Ask Allah to cure you. Right? You don't know? Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase you in knowledge. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase you in understanding. You start reading a book on any topic. On any topic. You start reading a book, a, 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 a deen book. You don't understand something? Make dua. Ask, ask Allah to give you understanding. You're reading your schoolwork, right? You don't understand? Make dua. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you to understand the schoolwork. Nah? So on and so forth. Ask Allah for everything. You need something? Ask Allah. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the six point of benefit is the perfection and completeness. Uh, well, you could say, yani, the, yani, the, uh, the completeness of Allah's dominion. Right? That Allah ta'ala, he controls everything. His authority is supreme. Okay? He owns everything. Allah Ta'ala owns everything. And that verily the slaves, they can never reach the point that they can benefit Allah. Allah owns everything. How you gonna benefit Allah? You can't. You ain't nothing. You can't benefit Allah. And likewise, the slaves can never reach the point where they can harm Allah. You can't harm Allah. You nothing. We are nothing. You see? But rather what? We only have an opportunity to help or hurt who? Ourselves. We only have an opportunity to help or hurt ourselves. You're never going to help Allah. You're never going to hurt Allah. You're, Allah don't need your worship. Allah don't need your worship. Allah is not harmed if you don't worship him. Allah is not harmed if you don't believe in him. If you worship him, who benefits? You benefit. We benefit. If I worship Allah, I benefit. If I believe in Allah, I benefit. If I don't worship Allah, I just hurt myself. If an individual doesn't believe in Allah, it just hurt themselves. They don't hurt Allah. The seventh point of benefit is that the slaves, none of us are free from error. All of us are liable to be wrong, to make a mistake. And that verily it is upon us to what? To make repentance unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to ask that he forgive us. All of us are liable to make mistakes. This is a, this is a very good reminder for the believers. Naam. So that they don't follow the way of the Sufiya. The Sufis, they believe what? That they, they're Mashaykh. They can't do no wrong. They're right. Right? And a person will say, man, that's crazy. That's crazy that, that, that you got people out there that believe like that. How they, how they believe like that? Person on the Sunnah say, man, that's crazy. Look at them Sufis. And then something comes around and you ask him, he say, well, what, what, what you doing right now? How you saying this position? How you making this position? Oh, the Sheikh said. You just said the Sufi was crazy. Now you're going to turn around and use it as a hujjah, the Sheikh said. Okay, so your Sheikh is a hujjah, but their Sheikh is not a hujjah. But guess what? Ain't none of them a sheikh of hujjah. Sheikh Uthimini said what? The mashaykh, the ulama, the statements of the ulama are in need of proof. They are not proof. They don't, they're not proof. But rather they need proof. Why? Because everyone can be mistaken. Imam Malik said what? Everyone. Kul yukhad min qawlihi wa yurad aw yutrak. Everyone. You can take from his statement, reject it, or leave it. You can refute it or leave it. إِلَّا صَاحِبْ هَذَا الْقَبْرِ وَأَشَارَ إِلَّا الْقَبْرِ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ And then he point, he said, except for the owner of this grave, and he pointed to the grave of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. Because the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, he was what? He was infallible. 
He didn't make mistakes when he came to teach us the religion. When he said that, that's the way it is. If the Prophet Sallallahu said it, it's true. Said, right? But anybody else in the human beings from this ummah, no, they can be right, they can be wrong. Because we're all liable to make mistakes. So I want us to remember that. And this is not to disrespect any of the mashaykh, because we're not going to go to the extreme where we don't respect the mashaykh. No, 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 never that. We have to understand their level, right? This is what Sheikh Albani taught us. This is what Sheikh Uthaymeen taught us. This is what Sheikh Muqbil taught us. This is what Sheikh Ben Baz taught us. Rahimahumullah ta'ala. And others from the ulama of our time. This is what they teach uh, taught and teach us, right? Is that we have respect for the alim. But because the alim is a human being, sometimes he'll make a mistake. You understand? He'll make a mistake. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like Sheikh Ahmed al Subai, he mentions, he says that sometimes Allah will make an alim do a clear mistake that can be seen by all to remind the human beings that human beings are liable to make mistakes. You understand that? You go through any of the fiqh of any of the ulama and you're going to find one or two strange opinions that's clearly, that, that's, not, that's, not, that's not right. To remind us that what? Everybody's liable to make a mistake. If anybody makes a mistake, we don't follow them that mistake. But it doesn't take away from what? From the level that they reach. It doesn't take away from their, from their, from their nobility. Because they're they noble. Oh, but they made a mistake. Of course, they're human. What, what did you expect? They're human. Humans make mistakes. But they, they're noble. They're, their level is, 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 is set. We respect them still. But this here is an error. Why is human? Make him, we, and we have excuses for them, Mashaikh. Yeah? Make excuses for them. If we ran out of excuses, we say it's a human being. It's a mistake. But this is a good reminder for Ahl Sunnah so that we don't follow the way of the Sufiya. Now, the eighth is that taqwa is that piety and corruption, then they both emanate from a person's heart. Piety and corruption, they emanate from a person's heart. And the proof of that is Allah Ta'ala's statement where he said, Ala atqa qalb, upon the most righteous heart, rajulin, upon the most righteous man's heart. Shows that what? That piety emanates from the heart. And also Allah Ta'ala's statement, Ala afjari qalb rajulin, and on the most corrupt heart of a man. Shows you that what? Corruption comes from the heart. So we have to have a concern with cleaning our hearts. It's very important. We have to have a concern to clean our hearts. Ninthly, is that, um, is that Allah's dominion, right? Allah's kingdom, well, yeah, is not increased by our obedience. It's not increased by the obedience of the one who was obedient, nor is it decreased by the sin of the sinner. Now, it doesn't change. You know, Allah Ta'ala owns everything. He doesn't get more if we're righteous, and he doesn't lose if we're irrighteous and if we're evil. Now, Again, our righteousness will only benefit us. Our evil will only hurt us. 11, the 11th point, excuse me, the 10th point is the perfection of Allah's richness and that of Allah's not being in need of anything and that his kingdom, it is, complete and that verily if Allah Ta'ala were to give every slave from the first of them to the last of them everything that they have asked for it will not decrease Allah's kingdom nor will it decrease Allah's treasures in anything it will not decrease it period remember what we said is like putting that that needle in the ocean you bring it out how much water is on that they said man that's nothing Right. Okay. Eleven is that yani, the uh, an encouragement for the slaves to be obedient unto Allah, and a warning to the slaves to avoid disobedience, and that every person and that everything that we do, it will be recorded either for or against us. Twelve is that verily whoever Allah 
has given them the success to, to, to the way of good, then they are those who will be successful with happiness in this world and in the next. And that this bounty from Allah and that there is a, and the bounty of Allah that he gave them this, this success in walking and uh, treading upon the right way. And the bounty that Allah Ta'ala has bestowed upon them and rewarding them for doing what is right. And the last one, the 13th, is that verily whoever comes up short is negligent. They come up short and they do evil actions. Then they will be punished with the loss. And they will find themselves regretful and remorseful. And they will be remorseful at a point where remorse is not going to benefit them. The person did evil, they die upon that. Now they come on a day of judgment and now they want to be sad. Now you want to be remorseful now? Your remorse ain't going to benefit you now. It's too late. It's over. Blame yourself. And then the Shaykh gets into the next hadith, which is the 25th hadith. But inshallah, we'll say that to the next class. Thank you.